It's actually okay. pretty easy to remember where Ward has been because she's basically been at Western Illinois University for <laughs> her undergraduate and her master's degree. She did her honors, both her honors project and her master's project in my lab. Was it on Caterpillar Spit both times, or did you get to break away from that for a while? Uh, the honors project was on tomato uh, genes, and uh, then the master's was on Caterpillar Spit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, and so you actually kind of came through a pretty good time when we had some money. Um, mm -hmm. National Science Foundation. So you got to go to, was it, uh, you got to go to, oh, I think it was uh, San Diego for ESA, yeah. yeah, yeah. E yeah. yeah. Ent Entomological Society of America meeting. Yeah. And so it was really cool is that you decided to um, work on your PhD at the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. Did you do PhD or plant medicine or were you thinking about both? Uh, when I started, I was thinking about both. Uh, but uh, plant pathology was much more, I think it was much more of a... Uh, combination of things that I really wanted to stay uh, work on, like uh, microbiology and uh, pathology um, and uh, plants, <laughs> obviously. So um, that's why I went to that route. And your mom was a uh, professor at, at Western Illinois University too. Was it in sociology yes. and African? She did uh, 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 both African American studies and women's studies. All oh, women's studies, okay. Yeah. And um, so then, um, well, you can tell us all about your background, but obviously you worked with sugarcane and a few other things. Mm -hmm. And then um, now you're in a postdoc position. Is it at University of Florida also? Yes, I'm still in Florida. That's cool. Well, yes. well, well, I think it would be fun to be in Florida. And of course, <laughs> unless you're working in a lab all day, does that make a difference then? Or? Uh, well, since last, last year, we've been stuck <laughs> inside all day. But uh, for the most right part, here. it's kind yeah. of, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good balance. So, you know, some field work, some lab work, some, you know, office work and computer work. So it, it is a good balance in Florida, yeah. So. Do you still make it back to Macomb? Does your mom still live in the area or is she? Uh, yes, she's still in the area. Uh, anytime I have time. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't been for a while, but yeah, I, I kind of make it through. It's been a couple of years, I think, since last time I came in. Yeah. I came back, so. I, so. Well, I was really spoiled to have you as a professor um, um, Dr. Bokeri's first name is Wortorda, Wortorda. Let me pronounce it properly. Well, let me tell you how I pronounced it. Okay. I pronounced it Awarda because you're constantly getting awards. <laughs> she goes by Warda, but um, I called her Awarda because she was, I think you won this about every award I can imagine at the time. Oh. Is that right? I did win a, a bunch, so <laughs> definitely. Um. So but thank you, you for the nickname. Yeah, so thank you for getting that. so much work done when you were here. And uh, uh, we are working on trying to get some of it published at some point soon. But um, we've heard that before too, right? But we're going to get it out there. Well, <laughs> let, let me go ahead and you go ahead and do the better introduction of maybe some of, the, of yourself and your background and then obviously present your presentation. So let me give you host control and power. Let's see. Um, so now, Warner, you are the host. Okay, let's see if I can share this. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Let's see if I do. If you will let me. <laughs> there we go. So thank you so much, Rich, for uh, that wonderful introduction. <laughs> Uh, uh, I hope I do a good job fully <laughs> pulling out <laughs> that. Um, and as he said, I'm Wada Tubukari, Dr. Wada Tubukari. Um, and uh, I want to start by say, <laughs> talking a little bit about my title. <laughs> um, so for most of the people that know me, I love learning. I just, I'm all up for it, like learning more and more and different things. So I learn, but also I, my interests are a little varied. <laughs> so, um, and not only that, but I love sharing what I know, uh, what I learn. So 
it's no wonder I ended up in scientific research uh, and then teaching and mentoring. So, um, so let's start with a little bit of background. Uh, like Rich said, uh, I obtained both my BS and MS at the uh, uh, Western <laughs> and mostly under, you know, your lab. <laughs> um, and while there, uh, there were a bunch of courses and, you know, experiences that actually helped and built or uh, maybe led the way to uh, what became my doctoral uh, research and uh, interest. So some of it definitely microbiology. Uh, interesting fact, I started as a pre-med <laughs> when I started my uh, bachelor's uh, and then I took, uh, my, I think, intro to micro with uh, Sue. Hamasa, and uh, I love this so much that I changed my switch my major. Uh, and as they said, the, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, we are. So, other than that, I was really interested into uh, microbes in general, but definitely um, interactions that they have with you know not only animals and plants like immunology. Uh, and then for my uh, honors program, uh, I mean honors. Um, project, not program, uh, I started doing research <laughs> in the muscle lab and uh, I really got into, you know, uh, doing research and enjoying more of the molecular aspects of skills that are involved. Uh, and then through club activities and involvement, you know, getting out and speaking <laughs> more, uh, learning more from people. Uh, and then for my master's, obviously, taking some biology and mycology. Thank you, Andrea. I definitely appreciate that uh, because I think without that class, I may not have ended up in Florida. <laughs> um, and obviously, teaching labs, uh, microbiology labs, and during, doing my research project also helped, uh, you know, me with the molecular skills and also with my sharing of uh, knowledge because I had to, you know, learn. Teaching is a, it's a learning <laughs> process and you're always learning. So uh, I always say both teaching and learning are uh, kind of, they are circle. You're always doing both uh, throughout life either way. So all this accumulated into me getting a, a doctorate in plant pathology at the University of Florida in 2019. So uh, the bulk of this presentation is going to be focused a little bit on uh, my research uh, that I did during my dissertation. So, and it's going to be a lot of, some of it is going to be a little technical. So if you have questions, you can either, you know, write them down in the chat and then we can visit them uh, when we're done. But I'm mostly going to be going a little more like on a, on a macro uh, uh, scale. So, like, let's get started. Okay. So, research. As Rich mentioned, my dissertation research mainly focused on sugarcane. Um, this is an economically important uh, crop. It's grown for sugar and ethanol, uh, and it's grown in over 100 countries, um, tropical and subtropical uh, countries around the world, including the U.S., where Florida is its main product, uh, productor, uh, producer, sorry. Uh, so I think Brazil is still the number one uh, country producing sugar. Uh, so followed by chi uh, India and then China. So sugarcane production is uh, it's quite easy. It's a per uh, perennial crop. So all you need really is uh, cuttings of the sugarcane which we plant, as shown in these pictures, and then these cuttings have buds, which are, have embryonic uh, tissue that will give rise to shoots, as shown in the third picture. And then about 15 to 18 months later, you get your mature cane, which you can then harvest. And next thing, you just leave uh, the same uh, cuttings in the soil and then you get new shoots. And then we have ratoon canes, which we harvest between nine to 12 months, uh, 12, sorry, months, depending on um, 
the type of soil you're using and also the cultivar. Uh, so you can actually have platoon crops forever. <laughs> uh, there, uh, there are some uh, fields, probably mostly in the reunions and uh, that are as old as, you know, some of us are <laughs> on here. But Florida is unique because uh, we only have one plate, uh, plant cane crop and then only two or two. So, so what was I interested or what was my main goal, should we say, for my dissertation research? The first is that sugarcane is also host to many pathogens. And uh, these include uh, bacterial, fungal, and viruses. And these impact the uh, yield, how much sugar uh, you actually get from your crop. So these are just a few pictures of some pathogens and the, uh, the diseases they cause. And for me, particularly, I was interested in gaining knowledge regarding two sugarcane infective viruses in Florida. The first one was uh, detected during a metagenomic uh, study in 2014. Um, and it's, it was a test detected as a master virus and these pictures show just some of the symptoms that the leaves that they use had. And these, sorry, uh, these symptoms are quite similar to what we see on sugarcane streak virus and may streak virus infected sugarcane, as shown on here. If you, if my mouse will work. <laughs> but um, so we knew it was a novel one because. These samples came from the World um, Sugarcane Collection in Miami. So my first objective was to characterize you know, the virus and to see how prevalent it was. So quickly, uh, what we did was to start with DNA extraction and then we enriched for circular DNA, which uh, master viruses have. Then we went through a uh, rounds of cloning and then sent for sequencing. Then later we got the sequences back, you know, edited and then assembled genomes. Then the next thing was to do a pairwise sequence comparison uh, to see if this virus was actually a novel virus or was it closer to a known virus. And then finally do the screening uh, of the samples in the uh, collection. So. So this is uh, the species demarcation tool for master viruses. So here we have some of the uh, sequences, master virus sequence that we had in a gene bank. And here we had the sequences we uh, uh, recovered from all that process. I just went through really fast. Um, and for master viruses to be the same species, you have to have at least, well, at least 78% sequence identity or more. Uh, and based on this analysis, so all the, uh, the sequences that we obtained were quite similar to one another, about 80 to 90%. And, but they were low, uh, less than 78% uh, identical to known viruses in the gene bank. So other than one specific, uh, here we go, one specific uh, genome, which was shown, which is shown here in red. So what this tell us or told us at the time was that this is a novel virus and based on the, uh, the uh, symptoms shown before, uh, we named it sugarcane stride virus. Uh, to name viruses are quite easy. <laughs> you start with the host, uh, mostly the symptoms uh, that you see, and then the word virus at the end. <laughs> so that's how this, were, uh, this name uh, came about. So next was, uh, we also look at maybe strain or what now everybody calls variants. Um, just to see if we had some uh, genetic uh, diversity in there. Uh, and this 
you do the same analysis, but um, your threshold is 94% genome sequence identity. And what we found was that this virus was highly uh, genetically diverse. And we just named the strains A, B, C, and D. <laughs> and the next thing we did was to design uh, primers based on the sequences that we had, that we obtained. And this was done by our collaborators in CIRAD, France, which is a center that's focused a lot on tropical uh, crops. And they have a, a big uh, uh, department on sugarcane. <laughs> so next, then we screened 571 DNA samples from the, the uh, collection. Uh, and we did this by PCR. So we use uh, 90, uh, 96 uh, well plates for this because 571 reactions uh, is a lot to do. Um, so what we found from that was that um, we had about, I think, 20, 21 uh, samples that were positive by our large scale PCR, but then we wanted to confirm uh, these samples. So we did another round of conventional PCR. And uh, out of these, 19 were positive for the virus, all coming from the uh, different uh, sugarcane species. And all of these had their uh, sources. They were originally from countries in Asia, as shown here. Right? So the findings for this was, uh, for this uh, first objective, was that we were able to confirm the presence of a new master virus uh, in sugarcane in Florida. Um, we called it, or we named it sugarcane striated virus. Um, the original sources of the virus indicate that this virus or might be origin, might originate by, from Asian uh, country, or countries, and that the virus currently is still restricted to the germplasm. So we don't have it in the field, um, and we don't know much of the impacts that it has on yield yet, but we know it's there in our germplasm, uh, which is used quite often by uh, our sugarcane breeders <laughs> to make new uh, cultivars. So this ended up being, uh, becoming two publications. So uh, if you want more information, we can talk about it later. <laughs> All right, so that was my first objective. And it was mainly focused on one of the viruses that um, I was working on. So the second virus uh, I work on is sugarcane yellow leaf virus, a completely different virus. Uh, it's a member of the Lutoviridae family and uh, the polyrovirus genus. It is the causal agent of sugarcane yellow leaf disease. And the symptoms of this disease are the intense yellowing of the leaf midrib, as shown here, and the uh, necrosis starting from the tip and moving towards the base of the, uh, uh, the sugarcane tree or stalk. And this virus or the, the infection or maybe the disease uh, can cause up to 25% yield reduction. That's been shown other places, not in Florida. So um, this virus is also transmitted by infected cuttings and vector by four different aphid species. Um, the main vector being Melanophis saccharae, which is the sugarcane aphid shown here. So uh, you can understand how hard it is to truly um, control this virus or like for it to, to control its introduction into a field or uh, into a nursery even. And historically, it's only been controlled by the use of resistant cultivars uh, or clean seed cane which is generated by tissue culture. Uh, so 
in Florida at the time, uh, we knew most cultivars that have been growing are infected in the field, but um, the impact of the, on the yield was not known. And uh, this virus also had uh, two other natural hosts in Florida and no resistance, I mean, the resistance to this virus was quite limited in our germplasm. So this is the unique scene really quickly. So we had the virus over here and we had uh, what we call the twin sisters of the uh, sugarcane aphids. So we had one of the sisters that uh, colonizes uh, sugarcane and causes yellow leaf. And then the other colonizes sorghum species um, that also a natural host for the virus. So first, as I mentioned, we were interested to, uh, to know what's the incidence of the virus within the field and what is the yield in uh, your losses, losses in uh, sugarcane. And for the sorghum, we were wondering if we might have uh, a new emerging <laughs> disease. And if that is so or not, uh, we we're also wondering if maybe our sorghum almum, which is actually, um, it's one of the weeds that grows all across the uh, uh, South Florida, the agricultural area. So we're wondering if that might be kind of like a, an alternative host for the virus where, you know, uh, it helps move to sugarcane. So we had a lot of questions, let's put it that way. And from these, we came up with four other objectives. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'm gonna go through this quickly. So we were wondering the timing and incidence of the virus uh, under field condition. Uh, we're wondering how the virus infection if, uh, affected uh, the, uh, not only the growth, but also the yields of sugarcane cultivars that were planted now in the field. And uh, we wanted to investigate the transmission efficiencies of the sugarcane aphid from sorghum almon, which, is, which we thought was uh, uh, an alternative host uh, to sugarcane. And finally, we wanted to identify sources of resistance in sorghum, grain sorghum lines. And this was due because uh, in sugarcane, sugarcane is hard to work with genetically. <laughs> so sorghum is related and it's much easier to work with and we have a lot more information. So we wanted to see if we can find resistance to the virus in sorghum and then transfer it to uh, sugarcane. So, so for objective two and three, really quickly, we set up uh, two trials in South Florida. They use two uh, different types of soil while growing sugarcane. One is organic soil or muck, like they uh, call it locally, which is dark and rich in uh, uh, organic material. And we had sandy soil or mineral soil as shown here. So we had two trials. Uh, we used a randomized block design with six replications. <laughs> and um, so we had two cultivars, two of the most popular cultivars used at the time. Uh, one was 1252, uh, which is common to both locations that we use for the trials because it's really popular and it goes well in either um, on either organic or mineral soil. And then for each of these cultivars, we had a plot planted with nice and clean seed material, so virus-free. And then we had another uh, planted with infected seed cane. So these were tested multiple times to make sure that they are either healthy or infected. And then for the timing and incidence, we use what we call um, TBIA or tissue blood immunoassays. You get leaves, we collect the leaves every couple of weeks. Uh, and then we use the midrib to make imprints on the nitrocellulose membrane, which we then process with uh, 
Vowel, uh, what, antibodies to SUILV or sugarcane ULV virus, wash it, and then we just look at it and score. So this picture right here just shows you what we're looking for. If you had the uh, red that had a blue imprints, that means you had a positive reaction because the, uh, and that your vi the virus is present. But if it was, here we go, clear, then you have a negative uh, reaction and the virus is absent. So I know this is a lot. <laughs> you don't have to focus too much. Just focus on the, uh, on here. <laughs> Everything at the bottom. Everything on the top is all about the infected uh, plots. So we knew they were infected to begin with. So here we go. On mineral soil, we had no incidence of the virus at all for plant cane for the first year. But then we had some incidence, Ooh, here we go, for ratoon crops. So only 7%. And on organic soil, we had some incidence of the virus um, in plant cane. And then we had a jump to up to 30% and then 33 on ratoon crop. So for the impact on yields, uh, we mostly look at ton sugar. So we'll uh, mostly focus on how much sugar you get from, um, uh, from the field, right? From uh, what you harvested. So again, we had sand or mineral so uh, soil and muck or organic. And these are the same cultivars. And for plant cane, we had, we seen there was no uh, significant difference. Um, fortunately for, and fortunately for first platoon, um, that was when Irma hit and we totally lost all our crops that year, especially for the one at, uh, here we go, uh, sand, on sand soil. So we could not recover that uh, data. So, but on mineral soil, we had a 14% yield reduction for one of the uh, cultivars, which is 797. And, and then on second or two crop, we had again some uh, yield reduction for the same cultivar on organic soil. But for mineral soil, we see uh, a, a yield loss of up to 27% uh, for 1252, which at the time was the biggest, they use this variety on almost all of the, uh, the field um, in South uh, Florida, but it's really popular. So, so what do we know? Or what are the actual findings overall, the summary of these? So the impact on yield definitely varied depending on uh, cultivars, soil type, and uh, or maybe locations. Uh, and also crop seasons. Like I said, plant cane, we didn't have uh, any differences, but then we see some differences in our tune crops. Uh, and over the three, three and a half year period when we were uh, monitoring uh, for SULV incidence, we only seen about 7% incidence in healthy, originally healthy uh, plots on mineral oils and only about 33% uh, on organic soil. This is definitely different from what we see usually in the field. Usually you walk in, you can, you grab a sample and you test it. In any other field in South Florida, usually it's positive for the virus. So this high prevalence that has been seen uh, doesn't seem to be the result of the natural occurrence of, I mean, uh, the natural infection. Uh, of the virus within in the field. So um, because this virus is also uh, can be found in uh, infected cuttings and that sugarcane is propagated vegetatively, then we, uh, we thought uh, that what we're seeing in the field is the result of, you know, um, infected seed cane actually being planted. So, all right. And again, <laughs> this became a publication. So any more questions?
let me know after the, at the end. Okay. So our fourth objective was to see how transmission, if transmission and the efficacy of it uh, from the uh, linafisaccharide, the sugarcane aphid. So what we did for this, since we're going from sugarcane to sugarcane and from sorghum almond, another uh, SULV um, host to sugarcane using the same aphids. But as I said, we had two uh, twin sisters. Some of these aphids love uh, staying on sorghum and some on sugarcane. So again, we had healthy aphid that were here and um, healthy plants tested multiple times for that. And we had some that were raised on infected uh, plant material. And then we also did collected some aphids uh, straight from the field. And then we moved these onto tissue cultured um, 1252 plantlets. And then uh, this was done for, we left the aphids on there for a couple of weeks and which is more than any other uh, study has done. And we then killed the aphids, planted the, pl uh, potted the plantlets and then uh, tested at three and six months to see what we got. So we tested by TBIA, as I explained before, and also tested by RT-PCR. So I forgot to mention this virus is uh, RNA virus, so we had to do uh, reverse transcriptase PCR for this. So here are the results for that. Uh, yeah. As seen here, we tested, uh, overall more than 500 uh, plants, but about 324 uh, leaves, sorry, not plants, uh, leaves uh, for the virus in uh, aphid rays on infected uh, sorghum almond uh, plants, and we, we didn't find any. So we didn't have any positive leaves at all, nothing. And then the same happened for the most uh, if it raised on sugarcane or collected on sugarcane. Uh, and we only had, for these, only about two <laughs> of the plants actually tested positive for the virus by RT-PCR. But at this time, again, this results um, was when Irma hit and our greenhouse was uh, affected and I think uh, the roof of the greenhouse uh, was not there. So it is possible that these infections were not uh, a result of our uh, experiment and that it came in afterwards. Okay. So we had no to very low uh, transmission using these aphids. Okay. All right. So finally, this is my last <laughs> objective for my dissertation, which was to identify sources of resistance, but using uh, sorghum or grain, sorghum bicolo or grain sorghum lines. Again, this was due to uh, having very low or limited um, resistance in our sugarcane germplasm. So what we did for this was to set up a couple experiments uh, within uh, Really walking distance of what we knew was infected sugarcane field and infected sorghum almond plants here. And we had 15 lines of sorghum, a uh, grain sorghum that we planted, right? And we let grow. And then we made sure that we give them enough time to be colonized by uh, Melanophis saccharide. And this this, all of this is aphids. <laughs> they love sorghum. They were all, we had like thousands of them, depending on the uh, line of sorghum. And then what we did was to use 10 stock per line. We collected them and then we did, we used TBIA. We did an upper, middle and lower uh, stock cross section, which we imprinted on the uh, the membrane and then processed. And here, if we had these type of uh, cross-section, this was negative. 
But then we had two different types that we considered positive. So this type is the type which you can see definitely the uh, vascular bundle, like the points that are blue. But the other is kind of like a blue blob. <laughs> but it was definitely different from our negatives. So, and then we're also tested by RT-PCR as confirmation. So, and here is what we found. So of all the uh, 15 lines, we had at least seven of the 10 plants that we tested that were colonized by aphids. And uh, the average aphid was between eight to 9,200. Um, and then when we tested these stocks by TBIE, we had one, uh, 149 out of 150 that tested positive. But when we tested them by RT-PCR, however, we only had about four out of all these. <laughs> so we had, uh, the results did the match. Uh, so we had negative plants uh, by PCR, but positive by TDIA. So we were thinking, okay, maybe we had a serological reaction that we didn't know before, because this, is the first, this was the first attempt using TBIA uh, to try to detect the virus in sorghum. So then we move on to a metagenomic approach. And uh, that was, again, because of Irma, uh, we were waiting on crop uh, ratoon uh, sorghum, but Irma, again, uh, devastated our trial, and we could only recover three samples from different sorghum lines. Uh, and these are kind of the results from TBIA, uh, high throughput sequencing, uh, and also RT-PCR. So overall, uh, SULV shown here was confirmed in all three samples, but then the uh, high throughput sequencing also found or detected Trilokin mosaic virus and a new Marathi virus, which is a new novel uh, virus for us, like in sorghum. And what we did was to make sure that uh, since we had these two other viruses uh, in the sorghum line, these three sorghum line, we're thinking, well, maybe uh, because we had these two viruses, maybe we have some interference. And that's why we were not able to find um, SULV by RT-PCR. So we went back, get 15 TBIA positive, but RT-PCR negative samples, and then tested them for the other two virus. But we found no correlation. Uh, none were positive for the Marathi, and uh, only about four uh, were positive for uh, the Shurikin mosaic virus. So, so for this objective, the finding we, were that we had very low SELV transmission in sorghum bicolor or green sorghum by uh, the sugarcane aphid under field condition. Um, and because of the non-specific uh, reaction that we've been dealing with in TBI or tissue blood amino acid, we were not able to find or to uh, identify uh, sources of resistance within sorghum. To do that, we would need to kind of fix that problem <laughs> uh, because it's, it's a lot to test all your samples by RT-PCR, it's time consuming, and also um, you might be prone to more errors <laughs> because you have so many samples. So that's why we use TBIA, which is an easier uh, and quicker um, uh, methods of detecting the virus. So what we did find, however, is that shuriken mosaic virus and a new Marathi virus also co-infect uh, sorghum plants in Florida. So again, this work was published and we can talk about it <laughs> if you want to know more and go into more details. So I know I went through this really fast. <laughs> that was a lot. Uh, but since then, again, some research, I've been doing research, postdoctoral research work. So 
my first postdoc was uh, on insect transmission of uh, deconstructed plant viruses uh, to try to uh, generate changes in tomato plants. Uh, kind of like, I know some of you might be familiar with this, where you uh, maybe similar to nanotechnology, where you try to uh, introduce something and then have the plant express it, uh, but using a deconstructed virus instead. So, um, and then I also work on the uh, figuring out what the cause of little necrosis in St. Augustine grass. Um, and I use nanopore sequencing, which is a new sequencing tool um, that is being more and more popular lately, as well as our conventional PCR and RT PCR uh, for detection and identification. And as which mentioned before, uh, I am currently working on uh, fungal disease diagnostics and uh, control using uh, essential tree oil products. And I forgot to mention this is in blueberries and peach. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. So overall, wandering heart, I've been all over. <laughs> I've been working on different type of uh, plants, you know, from sugarcane, from grasses, sugarcane, centipede grass, to tomatoes and uh, tobacco when I was with Rich, and now to blueberries to, and peach. <laughs> so a little all over. <laughs> so, um, but I also did mention that I've been doing some teaching and mentoring, and uh, I think these are also important to mention, actually very important because, you know, the next generation, uh, you have to mentor them and teach, you know, share that knowledge that you have so that they can uh, grow wings and, you know, find more things, <laughs> you know, advanced science and uh, all within all our domains. So um, I have been fortunate enough <laughs> to uh, administer courses in lab work, I mean, lab materials to I think almost about 200 students uh, overall. Um, I've taught, <laughs> supervised, and also uh, mentored uh, about 15 to 16 undergraduate and interns that we had throughout the course, not only from uh, the master's lab, but also to the Roth lab where I was for my uh, dissertation uh, research. And, uh, and this range from just microbiology to molecular biology uh, skills, um, imparting to plant pathology knowledge sharing. And also, obviously, I mean, Rich mentioned this also, uh, you know, presenting <laughs> at scientific research or at uh, uh, like field days. That's also important, you know. Again, you're sharing with not only your colleagues, but also you know, the new generation, the next generations that are coming in uh, and all the farmers <laughs> and all teachers is uh, it's always, you know, sharing of that knowledge and uh, also receiving them some more learning because every time I talk to or I share something with somebody, I usually end up <laughs> getting something, you know, uh, in return and learning something. Uh, so uh, at this time, I think... I would like to thank my uh, uh, dissertation uh, advisor, Philippe Roth, and also Jane Paulson, which is the lady on viruses <laughs> uh, that has been helping me. And uh, obviously, Rich and uh, Sue, also Andrea, I think without, you know, getting in your lab and really getting into research, um, I may not <laughs> ended up where I am. Uh, and also all the entities, obviously Western Illinois, which fostered me for so long <laughs> and uh, helped me get where, to where I am now. So thank you for your attention and any questions, please go ahead. Thank you, Walter. That was great. I don't know if you could put it out of share screen mode. Yes. I'm just about to, oh, there we go. Stop share, here we go. Okay.
it sounded like it was kind of frustrating because you have a, a faster technique, but it doesn't seem to relate yes. to the RT-PCR. That was kind of frustrating. Yes, that definitely was one of the uh, issues. And it, it was definitely frustrating for all of us uh, at the time because uh, you have a technique. It works really well for sugarcane. Uh, but sorghum is a new crop, totally. And uh, I mean, it's, it's another crop, but this was the first attempt of using that technique with this particular crop and trying to find or like detect that virus. So uh, we just couldn't do it. And it's much harder to do so with, let's say, a stock, uh, a sorghum stock than a uh, leaf <laughs> mid rib of the sugarcane. So that's where we were getting into issues. The other thing that really stood mm -hmm. out to me for I, of course, somebody else can jump in too, but um, you also had to deal, you didn't really go on to a lot about it, but you've had to deal with a lot of hurdles. Yes. From hurricanes to mm -hmm. just learning different protocols that don't work. And yes. I don't know. Yes. You want to talk about how, how you overcome those kind of frustrations as a researcher. <laughs> but. Of course, sure. Uh, well, definitely for research, I want to say definitely patience. <laughs> um, so for you know, uh, natural uh, occurrence, you, you really can't do anything like a, a hurricane. <laughs> you really can't do much. Um, so all you can do is kind of, I know it, it, it is frustrating, uh, but you kind of just start from the beginning because we had to go ahead, you know, set up a new trial. I know the, the uh, it was the same location, but, you know, the environment has changed. A few things that were different, but is you have to be per uh, perseverant <laughs> about it and uh, just learn how to be patient because we learn we work with nature and nature takes its time. <laughs> so um, yeah, like a hurricane, you can do much, but for like a technique, for example. Um, so when we started for sorghum, especially the sorghum project. We were mainly focusing on, okay, let's try tissue blood because it's faster and it will get us, you know, to the results. And we were only uh, focused on that. But then when we started running into the issue of, well, okay, all of these are positive, but we wanted to go ahead and try RT-PCR and then we figure out, oh, well, okay, we're running into an issue here. So we also tried other we are uh, other techniques <laughs> um, and ways to make imprints to see if uh, maybe it was our imprint imprinting technique that was wrong or, you know, any other. So it's kind of, um, you know, hit and miss. You have to try again, <laughs> try different things, uh, you know, look up the uh, literature on things. Uh, the problem with sorghum was that that was the first thing. The first time you try something is usually, you know, you're the first one to deal with that problem. But um, if it's a crop or a crop system that you, somebody else, or you have more information about, obviously go to the literature. If one technique doesn't work, try another that might have worked for another uh, project. And, you know, it's just trying and, what you get so yeah and just you know try to to be as cool as uh nature <laughs> that's what i call it it's just it takes time patience is one of the biggest uh i think uh tool you're gonna <laughs> need for research because it's rare that research goes what like the way you think it is gonna be going so you just have to, you know, back up a little bit and then try something else and then, you know, come back to it when you need to. So, yeah. I don't want to monopolize. Does anybody want to ask some questions? It looks... It could be just about anything, too, probably. Really. Yes, please. Uh, anything, experience, or, you know, you have questions about... Um, That's cool. You know, Grad school, definitely. <laughs> There's a lot of things. Uh, I know I like went through fast. all of it too much, too fast, but uh, there is a lot. So I wanted to get to this section so you can ask the questions you want to ask. I have a question. 
Yes. What exactly keeps you motivated to continue your education? Uh, for me, as I said before, I just love learning. I, like, I'm always trying new things, you know, like wanting to know, oh, how do you do this? How do you do, you know, like it's always been one of, I think, my greatest skills, <laughs> if you want to call it. But I've always wanted that. Uh, so that definitely helps. But also, depending, uh, it depends on the uh, type of um, projects, right? I only get into projects that really sound interesting and uh, kind of uh, forward thinking, <laughs> if you want to say, for me. Uh, so because I don't know the subject, so it motivates me to know more about it. So I get into that project or I get in, I get more information about it. So uh, curiosity is definitely one of the big uh, motivations for me. Uh, and I tend to, I love people. <laughs> so uh, wherever I go and I feel, you know, you, you, you feel that vibe, right? You just say you meet people, you know, you can fit well and you can uh, learn from one another. So definitely also rely on that. So it's a little bit of, uh, curiosity, a little bit of intuition, uh, and um, and motivation-wise, you know, um, we're here, so there's so much to learn. <laughs> so um, yeah, those two are definitely for me my, the biggest motivation for to keep researching. Looks like Rajiv had a question about wanting to know a little bit more about nanopore sequencing. Oh yes. So nanopore sequencing um, is the new, well, I'm not sure if it's new anymore, <laughs> but it's been a couple of years as, um, since I was exposed to it. But it's mainly, I was going to actually add all this to the presentation, but it might have been too long. <laughs> uh, so pretty much is sequencing, like you have a, it's a small, pretty much a sequencer and everything is packed on a, it's a to-go sequencer, <laughs> if you want to call it. It's everything packed in a little case. You know, you have a laptop and you can pretty much, if you have a good internet connection and uh, you can pretty much sequence anything you want <laughs> and uh, and get your results right away. So we, uh, we have a colleague that's been doing that in Africa, um, working in cassava, um, diseases and you know they will go to the field really quick have everything set up you know like you do dna extraction really quick you can do a really fast and uh, raw uh, dna extraction load your sample on the sequencer uh, you have a flow cell which has all the data compiled it's a small uh looks like a little brick <laughs> uh load that in there put it in the uh uh, the sequencer, and then depending on how long you want to run it, within probably you know four to seventy-two hours, you have a bunch of sequencing data that you can go ahead and mine and find what you know might be causing what you saw in the field. So it's uh, it's revolutionizing you know sequencing. So you don't you don't really need to send you know have your samples you know uh, extract. Uh, RNA, DNA, and send it off for sequencing, uh, and then getting the results back. You can do it on, you know, like right away, and it's fast. <laughs> so that's what nanopore sequencing is. And I know they've been developing newer and newer um, technologies with it. So if you want more information, let me know. I can send you links and everything. That sounds pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Hi, Doctor. I have a question. Yes, Ibrahim. Okay, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned earlier that it was um, it was a little bit difficult for you guys to to work with uh, sugarcane. So instead, you work with the the sorghum mm. plant. So yes. why is it that it's kind of genetically difficult to work with sugarcane? Uh, well, Jurkin has unemployed and uh, it's not, it has a lot of, um, let's see, uh, 
how do I, first of all, let's back up. Uh, so the sugar cane we have in the field is actually uh, called developed cultivars. And I think I mentioned a little bit before that these come from um, varieties of uh, different uh, genetic uh, materials from our germplasm, which are from all over the world, okay? So it's kind of a combination when the breeders work with these. Uh, it's a combination of multiple different uh, saccharin species that are being used to develop these cultivars. Is that understandable? It's good? Okay, yeah, thank okay. you. So, so that made it, uh, makes it like, the, at the end, the genetic materials you're using, I mean, you're working with, it's much more complicated than, you know, uh, let's say a single species. Uh, so these are, that's one of the, uh, the issues with uh, finding resistance. Um, and from another study, actually, they, they look at the resistance for the virus and they didn't find much. It's really limited within the germplasm. So that's why we went to Saga. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, what would be your advice to, I guess, future PhD students and master students? And I know it's a little bit different, so this, I don't know, maybe you can kind of expand on that, but just your whole thoughts on the graduate student process. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, kind of broad, I know. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's a lot. Well, for me, it was great. Let's just put it that way, because as I said, um, I'm always curious and uh, wanting to learn more and stuff. Uh, so, but definitely, I think doing an honors <laughs> project and actually having a master's helped prepare me <laughs> for uh, a PhD, you know. Um, so it is, I think going from like a bachelor's to straight to a PhD, depending on the program, I think that's quite a lot. <laughs> uh, you need to give yourself enough time to be prepared for graduate life and graduate studies. Um, it's, it's not like undergrad. It's much more focused, yes, but you also dwell into like uh, the information and uh, like much deeper. So you really have to, uh, you know, pay attention and really uh, be ready to kind of absorb a lot of information uh, and then um, process it fast. So if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, so my advice, I don't, you know, if you want to go from a bachelor's to a PhD, go ahead. Definitely save time. But um, I think a master's <laughs> kind of helps or at least a research project kind of gives you a little more uh, kind of experience into what a PhD life <laughs> is really or mass, uh, uh, a mass, oh, sorry, a graduate's life is. For masters, I think, uh, definitely use your time wisely because it's a shorter time. Uh, I know depending on the projects you do, sometimes it might be uh, short on time <laughs> to get it all done. So time management <laughs> and uh, Making plans, definitely. Those are really great <laughs> skills to have for graduate life um, or graduate studies. Uh, what else can you think about? It's like um, Kaylee, uh, <laughs> but before I add on to that, just one note is um, we, uh, you know, all those corrections you have to do for your thesis, it's just, it's not so much that we're trying to give you a hard time, it's just that's the reality mm -hmm. of getting something published or. Yes. Or anything like that. We actually yes. have another PhD student, uh, Kay Dively. Just okay. Told us, I think she wanted to say hi. Um, sure. Hey. She's at North Carolina State University. We're talking about Kay visiting, giving a presentation. I don't know if we ever formally put anything down. It might be the next semester, if, if not. Um, but uh, she was also been doing a lot of great stuff. So. Nice to meet you.
I don't know if you were on the East Coast, Kay, but we just finished up our presentation, actually. And this is mm -hmm. plant-animal interactions class, so you're a, an alumni from that class, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I still have the lectures. <laughs> <laughs> I think I actually still do, too. <laughs> Never know when you need things, so, you know, you learn them. But, again, that's something else. Forgot your life. Never know when you need that information. <laughs> You gotta yeah. definitely, you know, keep, you know, um, information and uh, all the little details sometimes really come in handy and uh, important sometimes, really important. So, uh, yeah, you have to pay attention to that too. <laughs> yep. So, does anybody have any other questions for uh, Dr. Bukhari? Well, I thought you did a great job, Dr. Carey. We really appreciate you coming out or coming online or however you want to put it. It's kind of interesting. COVID kind of made this a little bit faster and easier in some regards. Yes, so. <laughs> actually it did. That's true. You did a great so, job. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And uh, let me know if you need anything or, you know, information-wise or you have more questions. Uh, reach out to your, uh, Rich and, you know, he'll reach out and let's see. Or... Maybe I can send you my email and you can just email me. So feel free. And uh, I hope, you know, go for graduate school, okay? Because that's great for me. <laughs> but well, I, I think you, you can enjoy it. A few thank yous coming in on the, on the message board. Oh, yes. Well, thank you to you, too. <laughs> so it was my pleasure. And thank you, Rich, for reaching out. And uh, okay. so, yeah. Thanks, Kay, for the surprise visit and Rajiv also. <laughs> so, so um we will um return actually for the class now for mm -hmm. the interactions class okay. all right i think you might need to you know get your rain like the uh host rain back <laughs> oh, well, what we can do is um you can either click on my the, the dots by my name okay uh, Hey, Kay, did we ever make a formal date or were, you on, were you still just kind of up in the air on that? Not to put you on the spot in front of everybody. All right. Okay. All righty. So, um, right. so, thank you again. Yep. So, how much of a break does the rest of the class need? Okay, so um, Kay, did um, before you leave, were we talking about you visiting too? Sorry, I'm back and forth. Was that me? 